my my talk title here is uh, putting people in the map uh, integrating mixed methods and gis for neighborhood mapping uh, and i'm jessica breen i'm the program director for geospatial research support in the university library and i'm going to be uh, talking about a project that i worked on while at the university of kentucky in lexington uh, to show how mapping and gis technology can be incorporated into existing research practices uh, in this case community-based research and perhaps uh, identify some new geospatial tools and technologies that you might incorporate into your work uh, to enhance your research or teaching practice. And so a little bit about me, um, so you have a clearer picture of how I'm coming to this work. As I said before, I'm the program director for geospatial research support in the university library here at AU. It's a little bit of a mouthful. I manage the geospatial research lab. Uh, which supports the research and teaching programs at AU through the use of geospatial technology and resources, including uh, geographic information systems or GIS. I'm responsible for building and curating the university's spatial data collection, and I provide support for both geospatial research methods and software. Uh, and as of tomorrow, I will have been at AU for a whole year, uh, but prior to coming to AU, I lived in Lexington, Kentucky, where I did my PhD in geography. And my favorite thing about being a geographer uh, is how often when you tell someone you're a geographer, it results in a conversation about how much they love maps, which as someone who's been working uh, with mapping and GIS for a long time and whose research focuses on mapping and data and how those things shape our world. I love maps and I'm always up for a conversation about maps. Because maps are amazingly powerful tools, a good map can clearly and succinctly convey complex information to a wide range of audiences. They can illustrate patterns in data. Uh, they can improve decision making processes and provide context for issues that help people see the connection between the local and the global, which is particularly useful when you're doing community based work. So I spent a lot of time thinking about maps and geospatial data and how people use them and, and how to encourage and facilitate people using them more. This is something I write about. Um, it's also something I teach about. I've taught about these things in the college classroom and in community spaces where I've presented workshops like this one on how to start using geospatial software and data in teaching and research. I facilitated workshops for community members on finding and using different kinds of geospatial data and I've organized open street map edit-a-thons to improve local data quality. And I make a lot of maps. So here are a couple of uh, web maps. This is just my, my demonstration that I do in fact know how to make a map. Um, so when I was in Lexington, I worked as the research assistant for a project called MapShop. And MapShop is an initiative of the New Mappings Collaboratory. It's a research group at UK uh, located in the Department of, of Geography. And MapShop's purpose is to provide an opportunity for community and campus organizations to work with geography students and geography faculty, as well as our cartographic staff, uh, to produce geospatial data and data analysis. We also uh, made maps and data visualizations all in a collaborative participatory process. And this collaborative participatory process is really key to the work that MapShop does. Uh, projects are done with partners. MapShop's goal is to raise critical mapping capacities of organizations at the University of Kentucky and in the broader community. And so clients for MapShop uh, came from all over the university and the surrounding community. Oops. I clicked the wrong button there. Um, we regularly worked with both academic and non-academic units within the university, um, as well as some, as some local organizations uh, and the occasional state agency would ask for help. Um, the logos here on this page, these are just some of the organizations that I personally worked with through MapShop and in my work as a, an independent geospatial consultant. I also did a lot of work with individuals and smaller orgs that uh, don't have logos. I can throw on a slide like this. But as you can see, it's a pretty wide array of organizations. There are numerous academic departments, some administrative units, uh, several environmental groups and land trusts. I came to geography uh, through environmental studies. Uh, there's also a variety of other nonprofits and civic organizations represented here. And so from this collection, I want to talk to you today about a project that was done with the No Lie CDC. And so the No Lie CDC uh, is located in the northeast corridor of the city of Lexington. It's uh, um, the North Limestone Corridor here. You can see it in blue. And like many community development corporations, uh, the No Lie CDC is a nonprofit organization whose emphasis is on creative placemaking. And if you're unfamiliar, 
Creative placemaking is an economic development policy that focuses on the role of artists and art organizations on promoting economic vibrancy in neighborhoods. So uh, over here on the left of the screen, this map, very stylized map, uh, this is the vibrancy map that uh, Nola I put together, uh, showing different businesses and artworks and uh, organizations that are in the neighborhood. And so the NOLI CDC did a lot of work promoting art and artists in the neighborhood. Um, they worked on creating housing specifically for artists. Uh, they worked on getting a zoning change to actually allow in-home workshops and studios to allow artists to work from home in the neighborhood. Um, they established an LC STEMA program at the local elementary school to involve kids in an under-resourced school in music education and the benefits that come from music education. They sponsored street art murals. Uh, they ran a night market that brought food trucks and pop-up shops from local businesses, along with hundreds of Lexingtonians to a little side street in the neighborhood once a month. At the time, they were a staff of four. Oh, but they did a lot of work and they are largely responsible for the adoption of creative placemaking more broadly in the city of Lexington. And so I wanna take you on a quick tour of the neighborhood. Um, and this is where I leave Google Slides. We'll see how this works. Let's see, are you still seeing my screen? <laughs> you see a map now, is it Google Maps on the screen? Yes. Okay, cool, <laughs> excellent. Um, right, so I'm gonna drop us into street view and I'm gonna go to what is sort of the main intersection in the North Limestone area. It's where uh, NOLI was focused. And so let's go stand out in the middle of the street here. This is the intersection of North Limestone and Loudoun. Uh, traditionally, well, traditionally, historically, 100 years ago, this was the edge of the city in this direction. Uh, limestone will actually run straight through the entire city. The zero, zero point of the city is actually on, north, on limestone, where it goes from north to south. And so what you're looking at here, uh, this is the main business district. This is current, well, it's last year. Uh, and so this was the industrial section of Lexington. Uh, but industry in Lexington isn't um, disused factories. Lexington has horse racing. Uh, and they have bourbon. So there are bourbon distilleries in the city. Uh, this isn't actually where the bourbon distilleries are. This is where some of the warehousing was. So uh, over here, these kind of yellowish buildings, uh, that was actually built as a rope walk and a malt house. Um, there's actually a power substation right behind this building. It's huge. There's a car lot that will not die. This thing has been here forever and refuses to go away somehow uh, stays in business. The local utilities building is here. This is an old ice house. Uh, this is the key building that's here. This is uh, Gray Line Station these days, uh, but it used to be the Greyhound bus depot and where the city bus system as well as the streetcars terminated. Uh, and this was a large building. Um, you can see they have a block party going on. Uh, there's some a few businesses that are here. This is a bike shop. A uh, little building down this way was actually the original Kroger on this side of town. Uh, it's now a restaurant supply place. Uh, there's no longer um, a grocery store in this part of town. Uh, and you can see in the distance here, there's a, um, one of those warehouses. This one is actually uh, uninhabited except for the very bottom floor. It's got an Army Navy shop in it. And this is current. So if we move backwards to when the work that I want to talk about was done, uh, it changes a little bit. So this was Lucy's Red Light, it was a, a restaurant. Uh, it was actually vacant for 20 years. Um, you see the buildings are in need of some paint. That car place is still there. Uh, and you can see what the Gray Line Station looked like uh, in 2015 when uh, the work I'm gonna talk about was, was being done. This building uh, was owned by the city. It was a historic building, uh, but as you can see, it is vacant, right? It's not got much in it. If we go around the corner here, you can get an idea of how big this thing is. It's a couple of blocks. And this was just empty. Uh, and the city had no plans to fix it. In fact, they had built themselves a new bus depot in the middle of town. And then uh, the storage for the buses was actually moved a couple blocks away. So this is, uh, this is North Limestone. I'm gonna see if I can get back into my slides. All right, so that's the neighborhood. And so specifically what I'm gonna talk about is the North Limestone Cultural Plan. And this uh, took place in 2014 and 2015, um, when, as I showed you a second ago, the Gray, the Gray Line Station building uh, was still vacant. 
And there were a lot of questions about how uh, that space could be revitalized. And, and a lot of questions and, and issues around uh, gentrification, because there is a connection between the kind of work that creative placemaking encourages and gentrification. And this is a, a largely minority or historically has been a largely minority neighborhood. It's clearly disinvested. Uh, and so neighborhood change was, was a big concept uh, being debated. And so the cultural plan here, this was a collaboration between the North Limestone Community Development Corporation uh, several academic departments at the University of Kentucky, uh, as well as a number of civic and nonprofit partners. And it was funded uh, in part by a National Endowment for the Arts, Our Town Grant. Uh, and these, the Our Town Grants are the flagship creative placemaking grants in the United States. Uh, there was also a lot of money that came to this from the Knight and the Kresge Foundations, who are both known for their um, urban revitalization work. So the idea for this project was to create a cultural plan for the North Limestone Corridor. Uh, based on direct input from community members and residents. And this was going to guide both public and private development uh, that happens in the neighborhood in the future. So the big elephant that they were trying to take care of uh, was that, that Greyhound bus station. So when you do this kind of work, ordinarily uh, it's done in the format of a design charrette where planners gather stakeholders together in a meeting room somewhere uh, usually in city hall or a school, uh, and they, they gather to discuss options for the future. And the data generated from this consists of lists, typically. They're lists of things people want or they don't want to see in a place. Uh, and you also, you make collectively annotated maps, uh, like you see on the tables in the image here. So charrette organizers also collect feedback about potential designs for a space. They have participants place colored dots or post-it notes on design options that they prefer. But this typically means that the community input is coming to the problem after designs and options have already, to some extent, been limited by the planners and designers who are overseeing this process. In contrast, the North Limestone cultural plan uh, was envisioned as being an open process right from the very beginning. Uh, they wanted to, to ask community members and residents what they wanted to see without limiting those visions for the future. And so uh, they took an entirely different tack to doing this kind of work. The NOAA CDC sought out the input of people whose work schedules generally prevented them from participating in planning meetings and people who are just generally left out of these conversations more broadly. They held a series of bilingual community dinners where participants covered a broad range of topics about the neighborhood and its future. Um, they also conduct, conducted group and one-on-one -on -one interviews. And we also did these. Uh, and this is what I worked on, uh, creating maps and, and data visualizations, as well as compiling and analyzing survey and demographic data that was generated by uh, a series of radical walks. And so radical walks uh, come from the, the, the psychogeographic tradition of the Derive and the internationalists in Paris, uh, people who, who found the shape of the city limited and so uh, would explore sort of randomly through spaces going into liminal spaces, the, the bits between the things you're supposed to go to, uh, to sort of explore the city in a different way. And so we had participants led on a series of loosely guided walks through the neighborhood, um, which were followed by a more charrette-esque kind of collaborative session where people who had just been walking together through the neighborhood, had just experienced it together, uh, then discuss their collective visions for the future of the space. And as you can see in the photo here, uh, we've still got the, the colored dots and the large maps, uh, but you might notice that the participants are much younger and more diverse than the previous image. Um, the NOLI CDC sought input from a variety of stakeholders, usually the kind of people who are left out of design shreds. This included school children. Um, civic planners rarely ask school children what it is they want to see in the city, despite the fact that these are our future uh, residents and citizens and, and people who are gonna be in charge someday. Uh, they, don't, they don't ask kids. And so um, a group, groups of school children were brought in from the North Limestone Magnet, which is on a couple blocks away from that intersection and the STEAM Academy, uh, which is the science technology. Oh man, it's STEM, but with arts in it. I can never remember all the words for STEM, engineering, math and art, there we go. Um, 
students from that school were also brought in to do these walks and their input on what should happen to the neighborhood was solicited. Um, there were also walks that were organized for uh, social service organizations, of which there are quite a few in the neighborhood, uh, business owners, uh, and just general res residents. So as always, uh, the data collection and the participants gathered, it's never perfect, uh, but it was a, a particularly impressive effort to try to go after the people who don't get to participate in charrettes normally. And so part of the guided walks uh, included written community assessment surveys. I, I showed you the cover to this uh, a minute ago, um, where just as in a charrette, participants were asked to list the things that they enjoyed, the things they didn't enjoy or wanted to experience in the future. They were also asked to explicitly reflect on the sensory experience of the space and think about what they heard and felt and smelled on their walk. Uh, so unlike a typical charrette though, these lists of things were acknowledged as being spatial data. When someone tells you that they want more trees in the park, there's a place in the park that they're thinking of for those trees to be. And it's important to be able to gaze at, gather that, um, that aspect of the data. So we started out during the design of the survey instrument, asking participants to draw an annotated map of what they wanted to see in the particular places in the neighborhood, uh, one of which was a, a local park. And within the survey instrument, this was literally a blank page. It just said at the top, draw a map of what you want to see in the park. And the problem uh, with using that as the, as the collection tool was that you really couldn't tell what was going on in people's maps. People have terrible, terrible handwriting. And many people are not particularly skilled at uh, drawing landscape architecture. So you couldn't tell what was going on in the maps. Uh, and because you couldn't really tell what was going on, and the maps all contain different things, you couldn't compare them to each other. So it really didn't work very well as a way of systematically gathering data from the community that we could then use uh, to write the report and, and actually tell people, like, what did the community say about this space? Uh, and these are just sort of fundamental problems with having people use sketch maps. So people draw at different scales. Um, People have a tendency to, in their sketch maps, they put the most important thing to them in the center, very much like a, a map of Mundi, which are historical maps where Jerusalem is shown as the center of the world and everything else sort of radiates around it. Uh, people put the most important thing in the center of their map, and then they just sort of radiate the rest of the world around it, uh, which can make it really difficult to orient the map, to figure out where north is. If you can't figure out which way is up on the map, you really can't line up multiple maps to, to figure out what's going on with them. Uh, and because people are are mapping what they think is important, which is a great use for a sketch map. If you want to know what people think is important in the neighborhood, have them draw on a blank piece of paper. But not everybody thinks the same things are important. So the maps don't have the same things on them. Uh, so you really, there's no systematic way to compare these maps. But it was still super important to us that people be able to convey the spatial aspect of their visions for the future of the neighborhood. And so I suggested some other tools. Uh, the kind of work that MapShop does uh, and that I do as a, a critical feminist digital urban geographer, geographers really like adjectives, uh, this is called participatory GIS. And the idea here is to bring communities into the mapping process as partners. You can never really get rid of the GIS expert in this process. Uh, you still need someone who can use the software and you still need someone who can find the data and, and understands the limits of geospatial data but we try to decenter ourselves and facilitate people mapping themselves. And in my practice, this often means using low tech and free and open source tools because it's really important to me that I be able to leave my tools behind me. Um, maps are a form of power that has historically been limited to the state and being able to map yourself and speak in a way that governments understand is an incredibly powerful tool. But if you're doing this community-based work with tools that are never going to be accessible to this community again, you're using things that have $4,500 licenses on them, you're really not doing much uh, to share access to that power with people, which is a critical part of participatory GIS. So the choice of tools here is really important. Uh, so we incorporated a geospatial tool called Field Papers into the survey. Field Papers lets you create paper maps uh, the participants can then draw on and annotate, and then you uh, you take a photograph of them, 
upload them to the field maps website, which in turn creates a geolocated image. And you can use that uh, in GIS. You can do an analysis with that image. Um, you can overlay these maps in a GIS and you can see how one set of annotations converges or diverges from another because they're, they're based off the same base information. Uh, so we were able to, to gather the data in a way that maintained its ability to be systematically compared while also maintaining its spatial context in a way that didn't radically alter the survey instrument. And it wasn't a heavy lift for the people creating the survey instrument. They weren't having to learn GIS to do this. They were able to just have people draw on paper maps. And so uh, this is where we go into the live demo territory. So hopefully this works. I'm going to throw some uh, URLs into the chat. Hopefully, if I can get them in there. All right, so going to everybody. So this is where we're going. I'm going to take you to field papers. And again, I'm, I'm leaving Google. So we'll see how this works. Uh, yeah, so here's field papers. Um, field papers is well, was developed at a cartographic company called Stamen, who, though you've probably never heard of them, you've absolutely seen their maps. Uh, they do a lot of work uh, with nonprofits and with academic institutions. They were the key people behind the, the visual aspect of the American Atlas. Um, and they're, they provide base maps for web maps uh, that are used freely and widely. And, and you've, you've definitely seen some of them before. But they ran this project for 10 years, and they've recently handed it over to uh, OpenStreetMap, which, again, if you've never heard of them, you've still seen them. Uh, OpenStreetMap is the largest crowdsourced map of the world, and a lot of their data gets pulled into all kinds of mapping apps. Uh, if, you, if you look at the bottom of mapping apps that you're using, you will probably see OpenStreetMap referenced as a source for the data. Uh, Google sucks up data from OpenStreetMap. Uh, it is a massive repository of free and open uh, data about the world. And so this project is intended to enable people to, without the use of computers directly, um, make paper maps, draw things on them that denote changes in the world, and then uh, upload them to the computer, trace them, and put them into OpenStreetMap. But you can use this for your own projects too. Uh, you don't have to put your data in OpenStreetMap. But if you're generating data that doesn't exist about the space, maybe you would like to contribute. Um, so in order to make an atlas, it's actually fairly simple. The pictures here, they, they, they lay it out pretty well. So to make an atlas, um, it doesn't normally start on American. I admit that this is because I zoomed in here previously. It normally starts out at the, uh, let me zoom out where it starts. It usually starts out at the, at the US. It does do this two by one page thing when it starts. And so to use this, um, there is this little search function. Again, I mentioned they just changed ownership uh, of this project and the search function I don't think is working right. Yeah, it's, it's glitchy. So uh, in order to, to make your map, you just kind of zoom into where you're going. I'm gonna zoom in to Washington DC because well, it's annotated on the map and yeah, it's sort of pertinent to where we are. So I'm gonna zoom in, just clicking. It works just like Google Maps. This is, all right, we're going to campus. Campus is good, there we go. All right, so I've zoomed into my space. Depending on what I wanna map, um, I might zoom in further, right? So if I wanted to trace the uh, routes that people took through the neighborhood and the things that they maybe saw that they, they liked or things they wanted to add to the neighborhood, um, I might be this far out, right? Because I can trace my little trails through the neighborhood pretty easily at this scale. Um, if I wanted to, you know, map mailboxes or something or specific trees, I might zoom in further. Um, you can create atlases with this, so it's multi-pages. And you can do that by adding pages. You can add them vertically and horizontally. Uh, you can change the paper size to some extent. Uh, you are kind of limited in how big these things can print. Uh, and you can switch from landscape to portrait, depending on what fits your, your site best. You can switch between base maps. Uh, and again, uh, they just changed servers. So this has also been being a little flaky, but let's see if it'll let me switch. And it did. Uh, so it has some satellite imagery. There's a few things here. So OpenStreetMap uh, is what we were looking at a second ago. There's a black and white version. This is Stamen's uh, toner base map. 
There's some labeled satellite stuff, which can be handy if you need to know the street names. Um, not all data is visible at, at all zoom levels. So, um, oh, now it's misbehaving. So you won't always see the street um, labels if you're zoomed in too close for them. Uh, there's, uh, depending on where in the world you're doing mapping, there's also the humanitarian base maps um, from humanitarian open street map uh, who do crisis mapping work. There's also uh, some satellite data here and some uh, cycle, cycling data map here. So hang on one second, let me pop over here. Um, what's that? Okay. Right. So we can change the base map. Uh, you can throw a UTM grid on there if you really felt like it. You can add a label, you can add print notes. Uh, you can keep your atlas private if you like. This is on a public server. Uh, it does record um, the spaces that people have made atlases of. So um, that's usually not a fundamental problem for privacy in doing mapping projects. Usually it's the other end. That's when you have the data on the map that it's a problem. Um, but you can uh, prevent this from showing up on the list of atlases that were made if you wanted to. And so once you've finally laid out your map, uh, I'm gonna do this slightly nicer. Hang on, let me go back to the OpenStreetMap bottom here. Uh, I'm gonna do one page. I tend to find that uh, depending on what you're mapping, one page is usually better than multiple pages if you can fit it on the page that way. Uh, people do better when they don't have to juggle between lots and lots of uh, lots of pages when they're walking around. Because you do, you physically take these things out and you walk around and you map things as you see them. Um, so I'm going to make the atlas here. And this can take a minute. If you've made a really big one or it has a bunch of pages, uh, it can take a little while in order to, to work here. This is that whole live demo concept. <laughs> I did actually go through and I pre-baked some apps. So if this doesn't uh, hurry its little self up, I do in fact have uh, maps that we could look at from this. Yep, such are live demos. All right, so imagine that this worked. Let me show you one of the maps. So I've actually uh, have, on a different page. I apologize for the whining dog. She has discovered that I have her treats in order to keep her quiet, um, which is clearly not working. Let's see, if I get this copy link, I'm gonna throw into the link, into the chat, um, a link, oh, that's the wrong one, hold on. I'm gonna put in a link to my OneDrive file that I have where I have already made these little maps and they are living there. Um, and you can see them. And I'm gonna pull one up on the screen here in a second. Let me go to OneDrive. I'm already logged into. And atlases. So this is what uh, a field paper atlas looks like when they run. And so they have these uh, little reference points. And the big thing, the thing that makes it take so long uh, to run is this little dealie over here, the QR code. It's generating a QR code so that it actually can identify these images again. And so it can uh, georeference them for you once you have annotated it and uploaded it to the computer. So the way that you annotate these things, let me go back here. I also have some annotated maps. Uh, but because I don't have a printer, uh, I did these on my computer. So you might notice that they're they're drawn with a computer. So uh, you you literally draw on these maps. I normally ask people to use colored pens or pencils if we can, um, particularly when we're using satellite imagery like this. It can be really hard to see a black line on a map like this. You can also um, print one of the backgrounds that doesn't have any color in it, which can help. Uh, but colored pencils or colored pens are very handy here. And what you're asking people to do is to annotate the map. And so maybe you, I know these are quite tiny, but maybe you decided to add, these are some new trees. Uh, you, know, you could add that new art, piece of art that's in the front of the campus. 
maybe they built a new wing on the back of this building. Wouldn't that be lovely? Um, or uh, maybe one of those desire lines on campus finally got paved and turned into a new path. And so people can add data uh, to the map that we can then digitize. And, and typically in GIS, we're digitizing um, points, lines, and polygons. And so we ask people to um, just sort of draw in that way if they can. Sometimes your ideas don't fit in those things. And so, you know, you give people some leeway, but ideally having them draw points, lines, and polygons is, is the way to go. So once you've got this, you need to take a picture of it uh, and you're gonna load it back up into field papers. Oh, my Atlas creation failed. Oh, well. Um, so why we pre-baked some maps. So once you finally had people draw on your maps, you need to upload them. Uh, you can take a photograph with a cell phone. Uh, these things are meant to be done mobily. And then you just upload them. And so I'm gonna choose a file to upload. Whoa, my whole desktop. I've got some annotated maps here. I'm gonna throw this one in. Um, and once it's uploaded, it will give you a new file. And again, in the tradition of uh, live demos, it's not playing along. So what it kicks out um, doesn't really look like much. It is, um, well, those are the map images I made, hang on. It kicks out TIFFs. And so this is what a TIFF looks like. Looks pretty much identical to a JPEG, except that this TIFF, ooh, I zoomed in. That wasn't on purpose. Um, this TIFF knows where in the world it lives when you put it into a GIS. And so that's the thing uh, that we're gonna exploit next. And so uh, I'm gonna give you another uh, URL, another piece of software. Uh, and this one's called QGIS. I'm gonna show you QGIS now. Let's see if, let's see. I think I need to switch my share because I'm going to open a new program. But let's see how this works. Uh, well, maybe this will still work. All right. Do you by any chance see a, uh, a GIS <laughs> format now? Is it there? Yep. Hang on. I can't. No? <laughs> All right. Hold on. Um, no, we're on the uh, QG, QGIS. Um, oh, perfect. Episode. Awesome. Yeah, sorry. I have a lot of screen real estate, but not quite enough to be able to see everything all at the same time. So um, this is QGIS. This is a file that I've actually, a map file that I've already made. Uh, it's in the uh, SharePoint that I, I sent you, the, the OneDrive link. This map is in there. So if you go to uh, QGIS.org, you can download this, this software. Uh, this is a free and open source GIS program um, because GIS does not actually mean ArcGIS. Uh, there are numerous GIS programs available um, and many of them are free and open source. Uh, QGIS in fact works great with Macs. I'm a Mac user, I use QGIS. I use Arc when I am forced to. Um, so, if you're having students do GIS work with your class and you don't have to have them using ArcGIS for some reason, you can totally, uh, your Mac students can absolutely use QGIS. Uh, your PC students and people who are using Linux and Android can all use QGIS. Uh, it works on a whole bunch of different platforms. So, um, and the, the great thing about this piece of software, this is part of that leaving my tools behind concept uh, in that it is free. And so everyone that I, I work with uh, if I'm trying to share map layers to them, uh, trying to share map files and, and enable them to, to make edits to these things and to, to own the map files and not just the image that comes out at the end. Uh, this is free software. They can keep this forever. If you're working with students doing GIS, this is software they can keep once they have left American because this is free. Um, so this is, this is QGIS. In this map, uh, and again, you have this map file in that folder, uh, I have created uh, a layer for paths, uh, a layer for buildings, uh, and we have the, the OSM standard um, base map being shown here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring in um, that geotiff that 
by um, field maps. So if I do this right, I'm going to go to raster. Uh, the way that, that QGIS lets you bring data in, it wants to know what kind of data. It has little different inputs for different kinds of, of data that you're you're trying to bring in. And so um, these images, images are rasters. So we got to go to the raster one. And it is living in my GIS data box under tips because these are tips. And we're bringing this, this image. And my computer does this weird little thing where there is a another screen that comes up with that data. There we go. And so you should now, hopefully, you're seeing field papers squarely in the middle of a QGIS map. And if we make this transparent. Uh, Jessica, I think uh, your screen is not sharing right now. Oh no. I must have clicked the thing again. I have so many little bits and bobs on my screen. Let me get that out of the way. Okay, cool. Oh, now I can see what I'm sharing. Sweet. Um, right, so field papers. It's now smack dab in the middle of the map because this geotiff is a geotiff because it has geo coordinates in it. It knows where it belongs on a map. And if we go into properties, we can uh, mess with the transparency here, drop it down, uh, and you can see once I tell it OK. Oh, that was the global transparency. Hold on. Hmm. All right. Oh, I guess it is kind of somewhat weird. Okay. Uh, you can, if, if I made this transparent, you'd be able to see that it's lining up, but you can kind of already see it's lining up, right? You see the street goes through there. The street connects here. Um, if I wasn't using field papers, if, uh, if I wasn't able to figure out how to line my location up, in field papers, if, if field paper map in QGIS, uh, the benefit to doing it in QGIS is that you can do this. Um, so, oh, huh, I had it in there twice. That's why. Uh, right there it is. So if I turn that off for a second, I can actually rotate the world in QGIS which could make this line up better on a piece of paper. And you can essentially create your own um, georeferenced images this way or base maps and, that you can print off and, and let people draw on. Uh, it is much more convenient to use field maps, but field papers rather. Ah. I'm just gonna spin it the whole way. <laughs> we'll get there or I can just zero it out. There we go. All right, let's put the field papers back. Okay, so the next point of order, now that we have this map in here, um, we could just add them all together, mess with the transparency, um, but that's not actually going to enable you to do any analysis on the data. So what you need to do is to actually um, I've already made one here. So this is my paths layer. And so in order to digitize a path, you really got to zoom in. You want to be as zoomed in as you can. Uh, and then you are going to tell the layer that you want to edit it. I just updated my version of the software. So I have to find the edit button. <laughs> Hang on. Where's the edit button? Oh, there it is. It actually didn't move. I'm just not seeing it. All right, so I've turned on my edits. I don't want to create a new virtual layer. What I want to do is to actually create some points on the map. And so what I can do is I just drop a point. Oops, come on, little guy. Oh. My choice of red here is not helping me out. Let's see. Let's. We're going to change the symbology to make this a little easier because uh, my my line color and my actual color are a little too similar to be able to see them uh, and the stroke width is really tiny let's fix that okay All right so now we should when i draw on here actually be able to see my 
customers. Uh, we're going to decide segment. Oh, ah. I have my computer set on double click. Oops. And now, Oops. All right, so now I finished the line and it wants me to uh, tell it about the, the information that I've, I've offered it for what it can say about paths. And so it has no, uh, no ID number. I can give it an ID number or I can let it actually fill that in. And then the, the piece of data that I offered this one was to ask me about the rank. And so I'm, uh, it's kind of an arbitrary choice here. I'm just gonna give it a one. It doesn't really mean anything. Um, in GIS, we, we do point lines and polygons in different layers. And so uh, this paths one, that'll be your lines. Uh, buildings, after, oh, oh, here. after you make an edit, you need to save your layer edits. Otherwise they'll go away. And then you have to toggle off the editing. Otherwise you'll keep editing the same one. And uh, the reason we're not seeing the field path is because this uh, order of layers uh, makes a difference. That's the order it draws in. So you want to draw on top of things. So I need to put the buildings layer on top of my my data here in order to be able to see it when I'm when I'm mapping. So again, uh, if you're adding data to an existing layer, you're just going to turn on the editing. You're going to go over to this is the polygon tool. And you just have to remember that your computer is looking for double clicks instead of single clicks. You can actually set that up. Um, you finish the thing and I can give it an ID number. Again, this is something I already set up with it. Um, I didn't actually have any other data asking for in that layer. So. Oh, no, don't do that. Again, you gotta save these and turn off editing. And so if you didn't have a layer, like we don't have one currently uh, for these little trees that I have put in the corner up here. I know there's at least one new tree on, uh, on the quad. So in order to actually create a whole new layer, you go to layers, you go to create layer. These are shapefile layers, these are vectors. Um, you have to name your layer. You also need to be uh, careful about where you put your data. You should actually organize your information. So I wanna make trees. Uh, the geometry type here, your options are points, multi-points, uh, polylines and strings. So I'm gonna use points because trees are generally shown as points. Uh, it automatically has an integer as a thing that it wants to have. I can put in species, Oops. spelling is helpful. Uh, it's a text string, right? I can put in dbh, uh, the diameter at breast height. Uh, that wouldn't be text, right? That's gonna be probably a decimal. I just need to be that long and I probably don't need that much precision. So I can change the length of my fields and I can add fields to this list. And if I tell it okay, I can then toggle on my editing, it's a point, and I just double click on top of that little guy and it will bring me up this thing. So I can number which tree this is, or again, I can let it do it that itself. I have no idea what kind of tree this is. There's probably not even a tree there. Uh, and then the DBH, I don't know, 12. Um, and I clicked multiple times, so I added multiple trees there. Uh, and you would just do this again until you had finished digitizing all your trees. Right, and then this one's very large. And so this is how you, you go about adding your, your data. And so you can then drop out uh, the field maps and you can see your changes on the actual map. So most of the time when we're, we're working with community members, we don't have them. Uh, 
Oh, I see how my uh, share keeps dropping out there. Okay. Let me go to OpenStreetMap real quick and I will show you uh, an example of digitizing as a sort of a newbie thing for, uh, for mappers to be able to do. And so you can start mapping. This is um, OpenStreetMap. This is again, where the field papers lives. In order to map, you have to log in. Oh boy. I think I remember my password. Clearly I do not. Hold on. There we go, I do remember it. All right, and so we can uh, have to zoom in in order to edit. You gotta be real close. Digitizing is done uh, really well zoomed in so that you can actually clearly see what you're doing. Um, and so I'm trying to get this thing, yeah, here we go, to run this little walkthrough. So it, it seems a little bit complex uh, when you first look at QGIS. That's uh, because I, I was showing you sort of the, how you get this set up. Uh, when you have volunteers do this, they, they just do the digitizing. And so this is a, a sort of a quick walkthrough of, of how digitizing works uh, in OpenStreetMap. And so this, uh, um, this is OpenStreetMap itself. It's gonna try to walk us through. It shows you how to navigate. Uh, it tells you how to add uh, individual points, which you use for things like uh, shops, restaurants, monuments. These are, um, you wouldn't do a building as a point, but you would do a, the business unit as a point. Uh, trees would be points. A building would probably be an area. Uh, you can also do lakes, things like that. Lines, these are generally paths, roads, sidewalks. Um, and then buildings in OpenStreetMap actually get um, some special attention because they do some 3D mapping out of this. Um, I'm not actually going to edit OpenStreetMap right now. I'm going to close that. Right. And, um, oh, I have more data. Hold on. Let me go back. Okay. So uh, the pitch here was about mixed methods, right? And um, qualitative. Of data. So where is my my show? Okay, that's what it's sharing. So we added uh, objective things. You can actually add um, qual qualitative data to uh, GIS. GIS is uh, sort of at its heart. It is a quantitative uh, piece of software. It wants the world to be in ones and zeros and fit easily into columns. Uh, but there's been entry in GIS of finding ways to make qual qualitative data actually work with GIS. Uh, and it takes uh, getting a little bit inventive sometimes about how we can, can make this fit in here. Uh, because GIS, it is a demilitarized technology. Um, it does have all this sort of quantitative uh, obsession to it almost. But you can, you can do uh, qualitative data in here. And so during that, um, our radical walks, we ask people to think about the smells and the taste and the feel of the, the sort of visceral, uh, emotive, embodied aspect of the city. And you could actually put that into a GIS. Uh, and so I made a couple more of these little rasters. Um, I labeled them sentiment. So here we go. And it's underneath because it always goes underneath for some reason. Let me add that. All right. So we have uh, a very different uh, map. Well, so it's the same base map, but I've got some, some different data on it. And I'm gonna um, drop out the data that we were messing with before. I'm gonna turn off my edits and uh, yeah. So imagine here uh, that we're trying to map sentiment. So if we asked people to show us the places on campus where they are happiest, um, places where they're unhappy or uh, places they like to be and anything sort of related to how people feel about space. Um, we could do this. Um, in this instance, uh, I'm sort of I'm faking some data for how, how students might feel about broad areas of campus. Um, uh, the gender, gender and women's studies uh, department at UK actually did this as um, a regular um, 
experiment in one of their classes where they had students uh, draw on a map of campus sort of the places they felt safe and, and how they felt about different parts of campus. Um, and so this, uh, I've got little uh, green areas for where somebody liked the space, an orange area for where they were maybe less in love with it, and red for maybe someplace they felt uncomfortable, they didn't like spending time. And so to digitize this, uh, we would do something slightly different. So um, I'm going to move my layers around real quick just to get them out of the way because I haven't made a new map. And it's the same sort of thing. We're going to have to digitize this. So again, we need to create a new layer. Oops. You have to actually do the thing when you click on it. Um, I'm going to put this in my GIS data and then I call it sentiment. It's going to be a polygon. And then the information that I, that I want to add here. So uh, because I have multiple users, I'm trying to put a whole bunch of data together, but in order to compare it, I kind of want it all in one layer. I, I want it together. I could do this in multi layers. It would be kind of a pain. Uh, so I'm going to put them all together. And so I want to know one, what the sentiment was. Um, and I'm not going to use text for this. I'm actually going to use an integer because I do want to do analysis on it. And I know that that's the, that's the sort of spot where we're, we're switching from uh, we're, we're trying to quantify a qualitative thing. So instead of saying, you know, good, less good, bad, uh, I'm going to go with one, two, and three. So I'm going to use an integer here, and I'm only going to give it uh, two, two spaces, because it doesn't need to be a whole bunch of data. Uh, and then I'm also going to put in a user here, uh, and this will be uh, text, right? I can still use a number here. I can still number my, my uh, individuals. I don't have to de-anonymize them. Um, but it is gonna be string, right? Because I'm not gonna add users together or numerically, I'm not gonna do math problems on user numbers. So we got that. And I'm gonna go with that being enough. And so I can turn polygons and it's the same kind of thing. Uh, you would just digitize these spaces. And I would put in here, you know, this is space one, uh, the sentiment, is going to be so this is a green so i'm going to give it a one uh, and the user i'm going to this is user one this is sentiment analysis one and same thing over here which is another green one go which is number two the sentiment here is a one the user is still one uh and they have different id numbers right so it's the same data that's there but the id numbers differentiate the objects on the map and let's do this little guy. I don't actually know where I have highlighted on this map. This was random. So uh, if it's a space that you work in, I do not mean any offense. Uh, it is just a random choice of place, right? And so this is a three uh, and the user is still one. And I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna not do all of these because we don't really need them all. I'm gonna do an orange one. And so this is going to be, well, that's number four. Sentiment here's me two, and the user's still number one. And then I can bring in another one, right? So I have one, uh, one user's analysis of the space. And then here is, this is another one. And again, it dropped behind because my computer does weird things for fun. I close that. All right, and so we can now see uh, sentiment analysis number two. I'm going to move that in my little layers here so it's in the right spot. Um, I'm also going to change my properties here so that this thing is not filled. It'd be easier if it wasn't wasn't filled. Um, I am going to give it an outline though, stroke color, and make it wider so I can actually see it. Okay, so now they're, they're outlined in, in black and they can overlap. Um, this is actually part of uh, what we're gonna be using here is that it, it overlaps. And so I'm gonna add more, more spaces here. All right, so here's someone who doesn't like the tunnel. And this is gonna be my user two. And so I think this, this is number five, right? The sentiment here was uh, three. They didn't like this one. This is user number two. And I'm gonna do this one, because uh, it also comes near another one. If they get really near each other, it can be a little obnoxious, um, but you just zoom in further and it'll, 
that'll fix it. It's a six. Uh, the summit here is a one, and the user is a two. Okay, so I am now going to save my layer edits. I'm going to turn off toggle, toggle those. I'm going to turn off those layers. And so what I can do now, now that I have uh, this sentiment information into the computer, I can, in fact, visualize this. And so I'm going to uh, change the way that I'm looking at this. Can you guys see my layer properties pop up? Yep. This little thing with a gradient plasma on it. Oops, if I open the chat, I might actually be able to see the answers. Yes. Yes. Okay, am I back? You're back. You guys hear me again? Yes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, and it appears that you can see uh, the little layer properties thing here. Fabulous. So I'm going to change these layer properties. I'm going to change my symbolization uh, to being categorized. And so the value I'm going to categorize was that, uh, not the user. So I could categorize the user, and that would show me uh, what different people had. And so uh, all of users one would be one color, all of user two would be a different color. Um, but that doesn't really like help me see the patterns in what people think about space. So uh, if I do sentiment, I can actually, um, I'm going to drop that one out. I can actually see uh, how people felt about different space, and I can see that all together. So I'm going to apply this and tell it okay. Um, I really should, but you can see they overlap each other, which is kind of uh, slightly problematic. So if we go into properties again, we can mess with the uh, symbol and we can change the opacity. And so if we swap out this base map or we just pull the base map off, uh, you can actually start to see where things overlap. Uh, I've only got one here that overlaps. I thought I did a second one that overlapped. Um, but you can start to see these things. And so you could actually do um, a numerical analysis on this. You could, in fact, um, convert these to rasters. You could give each of these shapes uh, a value to the pixels that are in them, and you could add those pixels up. And so you could do like heat maps to show where people feel safest on campus or, or where they like the smell the most or, or whatever sort of embodied aspect of place you ask them for. Um, <clears throat> a little bit easier than that. Uh, and ultimately, this is uh, what the folks from um, North Limestone Community Development Corporation decided to do, was actually to just layer them with color. Uh, you can see it actually when these things line up. And so I'm gonna change this, uh, these properties again and in this instance, I'm going to switch it to uh, a gradient of color. And I'm going to drop out uh, the stroke. So the stroke will go transparent here. So no more little black line around it. And actually, that's uh, probably not quite dark enough. Let me pick a different color ramp. Oops. This wants me to edit the color ramp. That's fine. OK, let's go with that. And I'm going to tell it OK. Oops. And if I put the OSM background on it, that color's not very good. Let me pick a different background. Okay. So steam and toner, put it in the right order. Yeah. Let's get a better, um, better color. There you go, magma. This is maybe uh, not technically the right color system to use on this. Um, Mako might be a little bit better. These are all very pale. Um, oh, what I've also messed with the symbol a lot. Hang on. Let me darken them up. More opaque. Right. And so you can start to see them uh, layering up on the map. The choice of base map that you put this on is going to make a big difference if you're just visualizing it. Um, but you can layer these things up with color. And so you can actually see um, where these things are overlapping. And so 
Let me switch back to, go back to my slides. I have slides. Okay, so field papers. Let me see. Yep, you can see field papers. So, um, let me move on from this one. So, uh, right, <laughs> back to slides. So uh, some kind of uh, closing thoughts on, on how you, you might incorporate geospatial data and tools into your work. Um, it doesn't have to be a heavy lift to use geospatial data. Uh, you don't necessarily need to run out and get completely new data or different data to work with uh, because there's a good chance that you're already using spatial data. All data comes from somewhere. It has context. Uh, but it can be easy to overlook the spatial context of your data if you aren't explicitly thinking about it. Uh, in the North Limestone Cultural Plan, the, the data uh, that we use there, it was realizing that the lists of things people wanted to see in the neighborhood was spatial data and not just tabular data. Um, they had ideas about where things should go. That was the big shift in thinking. We didn't change the data that we were collecting. We just changed the way that we thought about it. Um, my favorite example of uh, stealth spatial data uh, is on the screen here. It's pictures of cats. Um, so I'm a digital geographer. I use a lot of um, digital data, a lot of photographs, things from uh, Instagram, um, a lot of stuff on the web. Uh, and we don't normally think about those images as being spatial data unless they're a picture of a place, right? So if you, you could recognize a photo of the Colosseum in Rome as, as being of a place, it's a spatial thing, right? We can, we can figure out where in the world that is. Um, but we're less likely to recognize a photo of a cat lounging near the Col Colosseum as being spatial. But depending on the device that you use to create the image, the embedded metadata can be can be there still. It can be spatial. Um, so uh, demonstrated on this little map here from I Know Where Your Cat Lives, showing uh, pictures of cats that have been geolocated around the Colosseum based on the, uh, the embedded data in the photographs that people posted. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> a little easier to see the picture when I click the button. So uh, the other thing uh, is that while GIS is a super powerful tool for doing geospatial, uh, it isn't the only one. There are lots of geospatial tools. Uh, many of them are free and open source. A lot of them are like uh, field papers. They are low tech. Uh, you generally don't find anything that's no tech. We are talking about computer mapping, uh, but you can definitely find low tech, absolutely can find free and open source software to do a whole host of things. Uh, the, the logos on, on this slide, these are everything from uh, free GIS, there's obviously Esri is paid GIS, uh, GeoPandas, GDAL, those are actually programming, those are Python languages or uh, Python um, libraries, you can use Python and R to do uh, geospatial work. You don't have to upend uh, your entire research practice to bring in tools, uh, you don't have to upend your entire project you can find uh, ways to meet people sort of where they are in what they're able to do and bring in geospatial tools. So uh, these are some of the ones that I've, I've used in my work. Um, and, and even though, uh, as I pointed out, the field papers tool that I use for the North Limestone Cultural Plan uh, produces files that can be used in GIS like QGIS, they don't have to be. That whole process of overlay of, of where I try to visualize the sentiment that people had about different parts of campus, that's overlay. Um, it's a fundamental way of how GIS works, but it's also how just graphics work. And so the, the staff at the North Limestone Community Development Corporation, I made a whole bunch of maps for the publication that we produced. Um, but for them, when they actually sat down to analyze their data, they threw it in a Photoshop. They were able to lay all of those maps. They're all the same size, right? So they just laid them over each other and uh, messed with the transparency in order to be able to, to see what people wanted and how it compared to what other people wanted. They just dug through their data, but they were able to do this using, using Photoshop. Uh, and, and Photoshop is you know, a ex relatively uh, expensive program. There are free alternatives to Photoshop. You could use Inkscape, um, which is another uh, free and open source piece of software that will work on a wide variety of platforms. Um, and you can literally lay these things on top of each other. Um, so really not necessary to upend your research workflow to incorporate geospatial data and analysis. Uh, there's probably a tool that can be incorporated into your existing workflow. Uh, and there's, there's no need to use a tool that you find difficult. Um, 
if you know if putting this into Photoshop or Inkscape works better for you to now analyze the data, absolutely do that. Use the tool that actually works for you. There's there's no one who's going to run around and, and police and say that you had to use QGIS to do this. Um, and my my final little pitch here, um, I can help you with this. Right, this is this is what I do uh, in the geospatial research lab, which is sort of both sort of physical and methodological. Um, the physical space, it's a computer lab. It's located in the, in the lower level of vendor library in room B53. Um, whenever the library is, uh, the lower level of the library is open, uh, the geospatial research lab is open. There's a key card to get in the door. Um, anybody with an AU key card should be able to get in. There are nine computer stations in there. Uh, on those computer stations, we have uh, geospatial software. We have ArcGIS. The My computer is very displeased with me today. Um, so I was telling you about the Geospatial Research Lab that we, we have computers, we have software, we have ARC on those computers, we have Envy if you're doing um, uh, image analysis. Um, we have QGIS, we also have GRASS, which is an, another one of the um, free GIS programs. Um, and these are the kind of things that I can help you with, right? So um, if you are planning a project and you wanna use geospatial data, I can help you uh, figure out how to incorporate uh, geospatial data into that, how, what kind of tools you can use. Um, I can help you find geospatial data. I can help you figure out what kind of analysis do you need to do? Do you need to be doing a raster calculator? Could you do an overlay thing instead? I can help you with cartographic design. Uh, how do you want your maps to look? Do you want them to be web maps? Uh, we can do that. Um, how you handle the data at the end of a project is also sort of a key part about participatory GIS and critical GIS. Um, you collected this data from someone, people should be able to access that data. Um, certainly the community that the data comes from should have rights to that data, they should be able to get, get to it. Um, and so we can store data in ways that makes it accessible to people. Uh, and it actually you know, keeps it long-term. It doesn't, doesn't get shuffled off into a thumb drive or a desk drawer somewhere and, and die. This, this persists and it keeps building. Uh, we also do GIS training uh, for both ArcGIS and QGIS. Um, we can do geospatial software troubleshooting. If you can't figure out why is it asking me if I need to build pyramids, uh, I can help you figure that out. And if you really want to use ArcGIS, uh, we have licenses for that. And I'm the person that you, you email in order to get an ArcGIS license on campus, uh, at least currently. Uh, we're, we're doing some changes in the way our licensing works this summer, so that might might shift a little bit, but at the moment, I'm, I'm who you go to for ArcGIS licenses. And um, I showed you this slide earlier. These are the folks that I worked with in Lexington. I would really like to be able to make a new version of this slide that has AU and DC all over it. Uh, so if you're interested in, in working together on maps, or even if you just want me to come talk to your class about GIS, you should totally contact me. And uh, this is my uh, little content information. So this QR code will actually take you to my bookings uh, calendar if you wanted to go there. Right.